Uh, let's all stand and worship together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried. Matt Odom, and I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Redeemer, and one of the great things about God's Word is that it's eternal, it is unbiased, and it is eternally fixed in the heavens is what our call to worship says. And also, and this is one of the most intriguing parts of, of this section of the Psalms, it says that all things are God's servants which means that even if you don't believe in God, uh, trees, the sky, everything in some ways reflects and serves God, whether we want to or not. And that's something that we forget all the time. And so what, what a call to worship is, is remembering 
that we are creatures a part of the Creator's work and design. And we are little artistic expressions of His geniusness. And so uh, when we are called into worship, that's what we're remembering. And this is from Psalm Psalm 119. And and so sometimes as a a congregation, we say this together, and we're going to do that this morning. So I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to say this call to worship together, and then uh, we'll go into another song. All right, say this with me. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. And by your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. Let's continue in song. This is a little bit different of a version, so uh, just jump in when you catch on. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Just to rest 
upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, uh, oh, for grace to trust you more. Um, we just pray that you would help us to see the riches of your grace, the riches of your love. Um, Father, you are so kind to us, um, and uh, we we hope and we, we pray that we would desire you more and that we would trust in you um, and that you would lead us to do that more this morning um, through your word, through, um, through music, um, through the preaching, um, and just through seeing baptism and membership this morning, God. Uh, we just pray that you would teach us through these, um, through these things this morning to, um, to love you and trust you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brittany. So um, this is... A good day, isn't it, Nathaniel? Nathaniel has professed faith in Jesus Christ, and he did that with me and Pastor Adam over some ice cream at Colby Ridge. What flavor did you get? What flavor? Rainbow, Rainbow Sherbert. And I think we can give a round of applause for Rainbow <laughs> Sherbert. Nathaniel, we are so excited. This is a special day because what was uh, promised and hoped for at your baptism has now come to be in your heart which means that you believe in your Creator and that He died for you and that He's saving you from your sins and that He will raise you from the dead to live eternally with Him. Now, those are heavy things for your little brain and heart to, to understand, and it's a heavy thing for, for my brain and heart to understand. But what membership is, is, is that we're in this together. And that table there makes us all come together so that we can encourage each other, and build each other up and say, this is true, all this stuff about Jesus. Now, when uh, we baptize your little brother, we're going to announce some of those promises. But what you're saying today, and what you said to me and Pastor Adam, is that you believe. And that is a time for rejoicing. And so uh, this, I'm going to do a little plug here. The elders are going to be present on February 20th and 27th. If you're a child or if you're an adult and you want to profess faith, 
uh, we will do interviews in the portables before worship from 9.30 to 10.30. And so you're welcome to come um, if you're ready for that. Uh, I'm going to ask Nathaniel some vows, which he's already taken with me and Pastor Adam. And then we're going to do Isaiah's baptism. And then I'm going to pray for you guys. Okay? Um, Nathaniel. You've already said yes to these, but let's say it publicly, okay, because we're part of this family now. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? All right. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Good job. Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ. And one of the ways you can do that is you can be obedient to your parents. You can honor. That's the fifth command. I honor my father and mother. Four, do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And you already did that at the congregational meeting. You're like, what are we doing here? Remember that? That was awesome. And five, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? All right. Now, uh, good job, Nathaniel. Isaiah, one of the reasons we baptize children is that we believe this is a work of God and that it is a sign and seal of God's union to us through Christ. Now, the point of conversion can happen after baptism. And so this is an entrance into the family of God as what we call non-communing membership. Nathaniel just became a communicant member. He professed his faith, and at baptism, this is an entrance into the covenant community because God works through generations. And so, we're going to baptize Isaiah in hopes that one day in the future, we will see Isaiah do what Nathaniel just did. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, what name have you given this dear child? Isaiah Edward Broxman. All right. Isaiah Edward Broxman. Come here, buddy. Oh, Gabriel was my first baptism in this church, and now you. You ready? All right. Isaiah Edward Broxterman, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May God be with you, little brother. It's okay. All right, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless this child, that you would bless Nathaniel, and that you would write your name on their foreheads, both now and forever. And that we would hope in your great gospel that you are, you are subverting evil, that you are rescuing from sin, that you are restoring and renewing and resurrecting at all times. And so, Lord, I ask that Isaiah would be caught up into that great gospel story as Nathaniel, his brother, has and as his parents have. And that is our hope, Lord. And so unite us to your Son, Lord, both now and forever. In Christ's name, amen. So what belongs to Isaiah is the top book and the bowl. And Nathaniel, you uh, have the Bible, the black Bible there underneath the baptism book. Okay, it is our practice here to uh, say hello to somebody next to us. So say hello to your neighbor, and Brittany will call us back to worship with the doxology.
All right, Redeemer. We're going to start singing again before it gets too out of hand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above even the oaks. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Redeemer, you can go ahead and take a seat. I'll take us through some announcements. Hey, Mona, how you doing? Good. I'm glad you're doing good. I hope everyone else is doing good, too. Um, all right. Children's Church uh, kids can go toward the back, um, and they will be in the trailers. So don't forget to pick up your kid after church from the trailer. They will not be released back into the building. So pick them up there. Um, another reminder that QR codes, as always, um, are on the back of the pews. I um, am not going to be announcing a lot of times today. Um, so if you scan that QR code, you can already have it in your phone. You can take a screenshot, email it to yourself, whatever, um, so that you have all the announcements in one place if you are not listening to me. Um, all right. The last day to submit your impossible prayer requests for 2022 is today. Um, so there are two baskets up here. Um, the one that says elder nominations is for the elder nomination cards. Um, and the wire basket is for your impossible prayer requests. So don't forget to get those in. Um, we would love to be praying for you uh, throughout the year. Um, elder nominations, speaking of which, um, start today. Matt, I believe, um, is going to elaborate on that a little bit later. Um, Courtney Erdman is part of a homeschool support group. Uh, Courtney, I'm scanning the crowd. Don't see her. Um, but if you want to get connected with that, um, you can either contact Courtney directly, um, or if you have yet to meet Courtney, you can ask Jen about that, because Jen is always the go-to person for that stuff. Um, the Women's Bible Study is going to be meeting this Wednesday morning. Um, there is another Women's Bible Study that also meets on Saturday mornings, um, if that works better for your schedule. And it just started, so if you would like to jump in, um, you're welcome to, if you are a woman. Um, youth group is also happening this Wednesday evening. Uh, that will be at Adam's house. If you need details for that, check out that QR code. Um, and then last, nope, second to last announcement. Sorry, y'all. Um, the elders are going to be meeting with kids who would like to profess their faith and becoming communing members, just like we saw today, um, which means that they would start taking communion. So this will take place on February 20th and 27th from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. So you can email the elders to set up an interview um, and let them know what kind of donuts your children like, and those will be provided. Um, all right, finally, the women's retreat is coming up. Yeah, go women's retreat. Um, that will be on March 5th, so save the date for that. It's going to be a total blast, as all the women's events are. Um, all right, I'm going to pray for our offering really quick, and um, then we will go ahead and do that. So let's pray. Dear Lord, um, thank you so much for this beautiful sunny day and the opportunity um, to worship together, which, as we've learned over the past couple years, um, is a really big privilege, um, and also to worship together virtually, um, if we have any joining that way. I pray over our offering today um, and just the people that you are going to entrust it to, whether they will be um, stewards of this money uh, or recipients of it. Um, I just pray that you would use these funds to bless others, 
um, and to build your church here in Lincoln and um, in faraway places. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks, Philip. So, um, elder nominations. Uh, this is how you make one. You write on a card. Index card should be near your seat somewhere. And you write a person's name as the, the no nominated person. So, I nominate blank. And then your name goes at the bottom of the card. Or you can simply email the elders at elders at welcome to redeemer.com. Um, or literally text one of us and say, I nominate this person, and I am a member, and here's my name. So that's how you make nominations. And if you uh, don't get one in this week, we, we literally have four more weeks, and so you have time. And any questions you have concerning that process, I did send out an email, but if you missed that, I have three copies of a document that explains in great detail uh, all the process uh, back on the um, back table there as you leave. So, uh, but if if you, even if you missed all that and you still have a question, uh, text me, uh, email the elders, and we'd be happy to answer any question. So, um, we are going to be looking at Psalm 19 this morning, and we are in uh, the a series on the law and the Ten Commandments, and this is the second of a sort of precursor to that series. And I, uh, I love this psalm, and uh, this is God's word to you today. We'll pray after I read, and then we'll um, discuss it for a little bit. So this is what God's word says to you this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard, and their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs, it, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they than gold, even much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Uh, it's our practice 
at Redeemer to, to spend some moments in silence before I preach. And in that moment, in that space, we're, we're praying that we would come alive to God, that we would understand that He's here with us, and that we would not just talk about God, but speak with Him, live with Him, commune with Him, uh, find Him to be beautiful. And so that's what we're going to uh, do in that moment of silence, and then we will talk about that text. So let's pray. Father, now we uh, want you to speak to us. We want you um, to open the door uh, because we want to knock and that you uh, would be on the other side. We want to seek and find you. And so, Lord, help us uh, by the Spirit to inch our way towards you, to open up uh, our eyes, as the psalm says, that our eyes would be enlightened by your word, that our souls would be revived, um, that we would be found um, fearing you, and that that would put us on the path to life because we are clean. And Lord, we know that this is only done through the Redeemer, uh, through where this psalm points to and to who it points to. And so, Lord, we exist in your name. Uh, We exist because you allow us to. And so come now. Your servants are listening. Um, I went to uh, Houston, Texas once and saw the display of an artist that I didn't know much about. His name is Mark Rothko. If you know anything about Rothko, uh, it doesn't seem like much is going on with his paintings. They're just large rectangular uh, blocks of color, essentially. And I went into this octagonal building and uh, again, I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know anything about his work. And there were like eight very massive uh, purplish, blackish canvases. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's more going on here than I'm aware of. And, I, and I'm sitting there for a little bit. And I usually have to get Sarah to like explain modern art to me because I don't get it. And uh, then I, I, after sitting there for about 10 or 15 minutes, Um, Something happened to me. I felt this uh, sensation that was so overwhelming and deep that I had to, like, leave. It was very, very heavy. And I later learned that this happens to people a lot um, when they experience Rothko's paintings, when they observe his paintings. I wasn't just the only one that felt that. But I think if I could articulate that emotion, I would say it, it was almost like it broke my heart open. And it, I think what was revealed to me was this sort of awe, like this awful beauty that was so powerful that I could not sit in it and I had to leave. Um, that's how Psalm 19 talks about the manner in which God reveals himself to people. What this text shows us is that you actually intuitively know more about God than you think you do. That something has and is currently being revealed to you, and it is the beauty and weightiness of who God is, and that it's happening all the time. C.S. Lewis called this psalm the most beautiful psalm in the whole Psalter, And he said, it's probably the most beautiful poem in all the world. And he was like a Greek, he studied Greek poetry. And so he kind of knew what he was talking about. Now, again, we're in a series called The Law, or The Ten Commandments. And uh, my guess is when you think about the law or the Ten Commandments, you're like, not like, "Oh oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. You know, you're not just like blown away by how pretty it is. But this psalm shows us that it actually is. We just have not sat in it long enough. And it it says that uh, when you do, when you study, when you meditate on it, um, it can speak to you deeper than anything because God has immediate and direct access to the human heart at all times. And he can blow you away because of its beauty. And that's what this psalm evokes in in us if we will sit in it. 
together. And that's what I want to do with you right now, today, for like the next 30 minutes. Um, it's meant to be entered and it affects you and expose you. Um, a lot of times this psalm is used to like prove God's existence. The church has done that for a long time, but I think it's, it's meant to be kind of uh, entered. And so we're going we're gonna to enter it uh, through these three points. Beauty in nature, the beauty in truth, and the beauty in the broken human heart. So verses 1 through 6, uh, beauty in nature. The first section of this psalm, what's being spoken and declared is this thing called God's glory. Glory uh, has the connotation of weightiness and things that matter, things that uh, get your attention. So God's glory is described as his creative handiwork in verse 1, his artistic creations. And what an artist does is that he or she evokes beauty or order or emotion that resonates with themselves and with other people, and God's creative work gets our attention simply because it's that captivating. The strange part about this, though, is that this way of God's communicating is nonverbal. Um, it says that there's no part of the world that can hide from God's speech, but you don't hear his speech with your ears. Verses 2 through 4. You see it. And David is saying that, the, the guy who wrote this psalm, David is saying that nature, the creation, just by itself, by, just by existing, is revelatory of God. It's revealing something about God, and it's part of how you know he's there. So, for instance, if I were to write a book, I, as the author, am not in the book itself, generally, but that story that I wrote reveals something about me as the author on almost every page. Artists are typically hidden from their work, but yet very present at the same time. And God says all creation, human beings included, are creations of his artistic genius, which is what you are. By just being. So everything is naturally showing and telling us something of God. That's why we started out reading Psalm 119. It says that everything is God's servant. The idea is that all things are an extension of and dependent on God at all times. And whether we admit it or not, he is distinctly known by everything that ever existed. Another example. Uh, my wife, Sarah, has a very particular type of script. They should make a typeface out of it and call it Sarah Koenig. Um, but if I, if I were to see something that Sarah wrote, I immediately know it's from her. If she wrote me a letter or if she, you know, writes anything on a piece of paper, um, she doesn't have to sign it or notify me that it was from her. It just is distinctly hers. And in the same way, that's what you are with God. That's what the sky is by just being a sky. A tree, by just being a tree, everything that exists can't not reveal God. This, by the way, is one of the most challenging things for me to believe about Christianity. Because what it means is that there's no honest agnosticism. There's no one who can actually say, yeah, I just don't know. What this passage is saying is like, no, you do know. And you know that it's this God. That's a hard one for me. And this knowledge is so pervasive, it's so all-encompassing, verses 3 through 5, and it's so bold that it's like a husband leaving his honeymoon chamber for the first night of his marriage. It's like an athlete who runs super, super fast and wins. And there's this sense in how God reveals himself. There's this sense of joyful conquering and delight in how he chooses to make himself known. Like that's the point. And nothing can hide from him. Like nothing can hide from the sun's heat. So this is what theologians have called general revelation. This is how we generally know that there is a God. But how do we make sense of it? This is how. Imagine if I exited the museum and Rothko, Mark Rothko, was like right outside the door 
and he was there to like calm me down. He's like, okay, it's okay. Uh, you're going to be all right. I painted to evoke that feeling inside of you that you're feeling right now. And what I wanted to convey to you is that wars are terrible. World War II especially, because he was Latvian and of Jewish descent, and he was right, or he's painting in the aftermath of how terrible World War, World War II was. And that art, the artist could say to me, what you're experiencing was my intended design. Now, that's what our next section of the psalm is doing. That it's, it's describing that what you're experiencing is actually uh, true and actually puts form to what you are experiencing in, in creation. How do we make sense of it all? And we're going to look at that in section, uh, the verses 7 through 11, under the beauty of the truth of the law. So what does the law do? And you'll notice in that section, verses 7 through 11, that there are various words used to describe the same thing in this, in this section. So synonyms. So you've got precepts, testimonies, commandments, law. Um, these are things that are all referring to God's revealed will. This is how God reveals his will in creation, his particular specific will. And other words are like covenant, Torah, uh, the word. And so what does his revealed will do? Look at the text in 7. It says that, the law revives the soul, giving life back to your spirit. That's what it does when you read the word. That's why we preach from the word and that it's not just some like opinion of another person, that this is where the power and the life is in God's law. 7a, his testimony is sure and certain, making wise the fool. Eight, his precepts are right, giving joy to the, to the heart. That word for right is, uh, actually means straight edge, and it's the standard by which everything else is measured by. The commandments of the Lord are, uh, the word is barar, creative or pure, enlightening the eyes. And this is my favorite one in verse 9. The fear of the Lord, so when the Lord is the dominant thing to your reality, the fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. And oh, how I would love to talk for 30 minutes about the Levitical system and how it puts you on the continuum to path, uh, the path of life and death. But um, I'm not going to bore you with that. But I would like to sometime if you want to get coffee. Um, the judgments of the Lord are true and completely righteous. And if I could summarize what this section is talking about. Is that this is what the law does to human beings. Um, when a person sees the beauty of God's revealed will in creation, the beauty of his truth, what it does to you is that it makes you come, become fully alive to him and to yourself. And it becomes possible, this is the bizarre thing, it becomes possible to desire it more than money. It becomes possible to desire it more than the delicacies of this world, honey, back in the day. For us, it'd be like really good food. Um, and they warn us. The word warns us to keep us in line with God's design for us. And then when we keep them, there is a prize at the end. There's a reward. So you look up at the sky and you say, there must be a God. Uh, here's how one of my friends says it. How, how do we know that uh, there must be a God? He says, it's kind of like looking up at the clouds and you're, you're like making out shapes of the clouds. You know, have you guys ever done this before with somebody? And you're like, that looks like, you know, a turtle or that looks like a dinosaur. Um, God's revealed will is like, I, it's like he came down. And he said, I actually made that cloud to look exactly like an elephant, you know. Um, and so what you're seeing is accurate. Look, when God speaks to us through the word, uh, he does so in each age. It's firmly fixed in the heavens. And it's unbiased. Because it's his interpretation of what he wants us to know about himself. 
And it's not our interpretation of what we think he's like or what we'd like to think he's like. And some of you in here, I know you, you're like, I, you know, I believe in God, um, but I just can't believe in certain parts of Scripture. Like it's just it's just too against uh, what I think is right. And, and that is part of the beauty of truth, that it's not tainted by your preconceived notions or biases. That's. That's what we want nowadays, right? I mean, how many, how many of us, if we, if we could say, I just want a, a source that isn't biased. Like, tell it to me straight. And the problem with that, even, even with us, is that we are trapped in our own minds and in our own time. That we can't understand stuff in a non-biased way. And so God has to tell it to us straight. And what our culture and time finds offensive about the law and the Bible, other cultures don't in the world currently. And in the future, those cultures are going to find something different to be offended by. And it's very, very prideful to say that 21st century modern, the modern view of truth is the right one because it's going to change and evolve. And so the question becomes, how can I listen to God more than I listen to the voice that's in my own head. How can I listen to God over against my own opinions? How can I listen to God over against just the strongest personality in my life? How can I think that the law is actually better than money or food? And here's where I, I really want to drill down, because this is where the psalm goes. Because I think you, you gain a deeper understanding of how you can get there through understanding your own heart, specifically its brokenness. So point three, the beauty in the broken human heart, verses 12 through 14. I mean, let's be honest, like, do you really think that the Bible is sweet? Do you think that uh, it is possible to delight in the Bible, in the scriptures, more than you delight in stuff like sex, stuff like money, uh, stuff like comfort. Um, I'm speaking to you as if you're the type of person that you really, I mean, let's just be completely real. Um, You'd rather unload the dishwasher than read your Bible, okay? Let's say you're there. Um, Is it possible that somebody like that can actually change and begin to desire God more than anything else in the world. This psalm tells you how. Verse 12, who, and it's it's very strange how you get there, who can discern his errors or declare me innocent of hidden faults? Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. This is what that verse is saying. Those two verses is saying that we don't even understand ourselves or what's inside of us. That we are a mystery to ourselves. And you may struggle, you know, like I do. You may struggle with anger. You may struggle with lust. You may struggle with comparison and those are obvious things to you and to other people observing you but what these verses are saying is that there are things living inside of me hidden things that would rule and dominate me if it weren't for God's intervention that's a hard one for us and I want to say something plainly and if you will allow me a few minutes to defend the thought Uh, the beauty of God, the beauty especially of the hard stuff in your life and in Scripture that are hard to focus on, that you don't want to focus on, is the exact center for how you convert to Christianity and how you grow in your knowledge of God and your love for Him. The stuff that's hard to go to is the center for how you will find God to be beautiful, for how you will learn to have a taste for Him like the sweetness of honey. Here's what I mean. Sarah and I have a rule for, we have a law in our home for our son Lazarus, and it's that he must hold our hand when he is walking near a busy street. 
Um, now, what if he went to school tomorrow and one of his friends said, you know, your parents make you hold their hand when you walk near a street? I don't have to hold my parents' hand. That's weird. Um, and you can see, you know, the, the thought gets planted in my son's mind. You know, what if my parents are trying to keep something back from me? What, if, what, what would happen if I didn't hold their hand and I let it go and I ran? And let's say the next day he wiggles out of our hand and a car zooms by and it, and it almost, you know, hits him and he almost has an accident. And I run over and he sees the fear and love in my eyes and I see the fear and love in his eyes and we have this moment. What does he learn in that process? He learns that that rule was in place because I love him, not because I'm trying to limit his freedom. He learns it. Now, this is real weird, and this is how it works in the human heart. We learn God's goodness. We learn to trust him through the exact areas in which we broke his law. That the gospel becomes most sweet where we are the most broken. This is how God prevents presumptuous sin from having dominion over us. You know what presumptuous sin is? That we presume to know what's best. And when that happens, God sometimes in his grace lets us have life just a little bit the way that we want it. So that we will know how bitter life is without him. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. He says that when sin teams up with the law, what it produces is guilt and shame and depression and ultimately death. But thanks be to God that when you die to that which held you captive, you come alive in the spirit. You become who you are. You become, well, somebody who likes the law. Here's how this plays itself out. When you feel in your heart of hearts, there is literally nothing else I would rather do than obey God because it's simply better. It's the top choice. Holding the hand is better than running without boundaries around a busy street. It's better. Think about your life. Aren't there things that you've gone after? Even when you're little and get old, same stuff, it just morphs. Aren't there things that you've gone after and you saw the wreckage and futility of it? Maybe you saw the danger of it and you knew in that moment that God's warnings were actually really great and kind. And you begin to want it. There's a, there's a psalm that says, when you begin to trust God in this way, that you become like a child that weans itself from its from his mother, but stays close to him. Of your own initiative. That growth comes when my son Lazarus sees the danger of the street and stays within the boundaries because he wants to. Because he trusts me. Look, is there anything in your life that you do in obedience to the Scripture simply because it's the sweetest thing you've ever experienced? That's where God is pushing you towards. That's the goal. That's when you become free as a human being because it speaks to you most deeply. He has immediate access to your heart. And if He created you, He knows how you operate, and He knows what turns you on, and He knows what speaks to you most deeply. And he said, look, if, if you want that from him, if you want that from him, God gives you what you want out of him. He says, seek, and you will find me. Knock, and I will open the door. If you don't want it, that's fine too. He leaves, he leaves you that freedom. But I'll leave, I believe part of what the psalm is saying is that maybe the reason that you have not found the sweetness of God's rules is because you don't think sin is sin. I have a dear friend who says that I, I think one of the most destructive things that's ever been taught in the world is this concept of original sin. And in the same breath, he'll express so much pain 
with how broken the world is. And I, I find sin, the way it's described in the Bible, you know that word transgression, it means rebellion against your creator. It's a personal affront on the one who loved and created you the most. And what sin seeks to do is it seeks to get us to devalue one another, to dehumanize one another through division and isolation and fear and violence. And the teaching of sin in Christianity is the only thing accurate and comprehensive enough to describe what's going on in the world and inside my very heart. It's really accurate. And so, what is the answer? The answer is verse 14. You need a Redeemer. I need a Redeemer. And how the Redeemer works is that God zeroes in on those places of the brokenness which the law exposes, and he makes us watch and wait on how God is going to reconcile us back to himself and back to other people. That's what he does. And this typically happens through the exposure of the exact thing that we've been avoiding in our lives and in Scripture. But the beautiful part is, if you will let the law expose you, if you will let God expose you, and you sit in that with other people, and you let yourself be loved in that exposure, that is what turns the human heart on forever. That is where the beauty of the broken human heart will capture you. And you convert. And you stay converted. This is what it means to be acceptable in the sight of God. That God uses the places of our deepest sin and struggle to do his greatest work. Y'all have heard it in your lives so many times. I see it in my own. It's good news of how God subverts evil itself, pushes evil against itself to renew and restore and reconcile. You know, redemption means to buy something back, that something's been bought back. And this is how God changes people. He makes you the most obedient where you were the most disobedient. And he makes your heart come alive where it was the most broken. And so here's my encouragement to you. And I'm speaking uh, to the church and, and to those outside the church. Please don't do away with the concept of sin. Uh, don't avoid the places in your life or in scripture that you can barely stomach or talk about. I'm not saying that you always have to go there and that you have to stay there all the time, but what I'm saying is when they come and when it's exposed in you or when the places in Scripture that are hard to read come across, you, know, you come across them, don't avoid it. Because there you will find Jesus and there he will change you into somebody who delights in his law and delights in his word. That's what his revelation does. That's how he reveals himself to human beings. The beauty in nature, the beauty of truth, and the beauty of the broken human heart are seen most clearly in Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Let's pray and continue in worship. Father, we do thank you for uh, the, the weightiness of your word. And if we just sit in it for just a little bit, oh, um, it's like, it's just heavy in a good way. And it exposes us in a way that uh, feels so eternal and that we were made for. And there are certain aspects of what you call us to do that drive that uh, gospel goodness even deeper into us. And it's the sacraments, Lord, where the, in some mysterious way um, we get to tap into how beautiful you actually are and what we were made for. And so would you do that through this supper, uh, through communion? We thank you for Nathaniel coming to the table for the first time. Uh, we praise you for uh, the way in which you sustain us and bring us close to yourself. In Christ's name, amen. Come to the time in our service for the con. Um, confession of sin, and uh, listening to Matt preach the truth today, which reminded me, and, and seeing Nathaniel make his public profession today, reminded me, we are all on a journey, right? It's not a single event. 
Nathaniel professing publicly that he believes it's not the event and now all things will be great for him. Um, everything will be easy. We're on a journey. Um, and that journey is a process of God revealing his beauty to us through the nature, through truth, and through uh, broken human hearts and, and tough times. I think I get it on the nature. I get it on the truth. I don't, revealing his beauty through the broken human hearts is, is a more difficult one, but it's true. Um, God gives us hard stuff, right? Uh, sometimes people don't, we all, we're the only ones to know about it because it's in our heads. Sometimes others are around us know our hard stuff. But that's part of the journey. It's part of God's revealing his beauty to us um, because that hard stuff a lot of times reveals what our hearts truly are, and they are broken. And he wants us to know that. But he wants us to know more that he's not going to leave us there. He's redeeming us from that. And even though it can be messy to start in that brokenness and recognize that brokenness, uh, it's beautiful where you end up because of that truth that he has given us a redeemer. And that's where growth happens. That's the journey. And we're all at different stages in the journey, right? But God's bringing those events to us, those situations to us, to grow us closer to him. So, uh Part of that is recognizing the sin and the brokenness in our heart. So we're going to um, read the confession of sin together. That'll be up on the board there, and then we will uh, have a time of silent, silent uh, prayer where you can um, confess on your own. Then I'll bring us back together for the assurance of forgiveness. So let's read this confession of sin together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life, so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment individually. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for letting us confess our sins to you. Thank you for assuring us of our forgiveness, that you won't leave us there, and uh, that your son, our redeemer, is, um, is for just that, to redeem us from the brokenness of our heart. So we thank you for that. In your name we pray. So I'll read our assurance of forgiveness. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Man, thank you, Troy. Um... I'm a I'm a bit of a foodie, uh, and I I used to eat all sorts of weird stuff when I was in high school. I used to crave Fruit Loops. I would eat you know so many things coming home from school that were unhealthy Pop Tarts. Um, and you guys, now I wake up and there's nothing more that I would rather eat than pumpkin oatmeal. I mean, what happened to me? You know. Um, I don't know what went wrong, uh, but 
my point is you can actually train yourself to desire different things. And what this meal does to the human heart is that it says that the gospel is the thing that the human heart wants most of all. Um, we've been living on filth constantly. Um, that's what that psalm talks about. That, that's not the point. The point is God is calling you to himself. And the way to get healthy spiritually is to tap into things that are invisible. And it's hard to believe because we're talking about somebody that rose from the dead. We're talking about somebody that died uh, and bled for me, and I've never met him physically. Um, and that's hard. But the way that you grow accustomed to this, to following Jesus, is this meal. And you might wake up one day and think, I don't know how I got here, but I believe it, and I crave it, and I long for it. And if there is some part of you that wants to be on that path right now, even if you don't have much of a taste for it, this table is for you. The more you take it, the more your appetite increases for the Lord Jesus. If there's no part of you that wants Jesus Christ at all, we are super thankful that you're here. This is a part of our service that we would want you to observe. No one's going to judge you if you don't come and take this table, but we would want you to take this in faith that you're heading towards Christ, that you want to develop a taste for him. Um, and so uh, if you, this is not a Presbyterian table, a Redeemer table, this is any who profess faith in Christ are welcome here. A couple of logistic things. Um, we do this coming down in two rows, and the grape juice is the purple ring on the outside of the tray. I'll let Nathaniel know for sure, because he was worried about that. Um, and you can take a piece of bread and, and some grape juice or wine, and then you exit this way, and there's some trash cans here. So it's our practice. Uh, I'm going to set the elements apart, um, pray, and then the musicians will come up, and then you guys are welcome. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it for the forgiveness of sins. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray. Father, we set this meal apart for its special use. We believe that you commune with us spiritually. And so would you do that now? Would you nourish your people? Uh, would you give us enough sustenance to um, not just make it through another week, but to embody the fruits of the Spirit, to have Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, and self-control towards one another and towards those in the city of Lincoln. And so uh, there is power here, Lord. Uh, you say against such things there is no law when we embody the, the fruit of the Spirit. And so would you grow that in our hearts? Would you grow that towards, uh, that we would grow towards one another in that way um, and that we would come into contact with Jesus here through the Spirit in Christ's name? Uh, amen. Musicians are invited up.
pray. Father, I do ask that we would bear your image in our face. And as we uh, live and move and work uh, and eat and all sorts of things, all the good things that you've given us to do, that we would not do those things uh, independent from you, but that we would do all that you've given us uh, in thanksgiving and that we would bear your image. And so, Lord, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for the reminder of the gospel uh, and the hope of what's to come. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing one final song. see the benediction. Benediction means good word, and this is God's good word to you and over you this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bless you with peace. Go in grace and peace. Amen. First service.